Good morning. My name is Megan Barone, and I am the Director of Campus Discipleship and Outreach, and I will be doing your announcements today. First, just to give you an update on GD4L, we have 430 different people in uh, Bible classes, life groups, and who are doing it at home, so we thank and praise God for that. If you'd like a booklet, or you, if you'd like to join up a group, or if you'd like to take one home to look at it, or write in sermon notes, if you need information, go check out the website and come see us in the Narthex, the ministry staff. So thank you and blessings on your worship. Our order of service that we'll be using today uh, is uh, really centered around many of the themes we'll be exploring in our six-week sermon studies. Uh, so you'll, you'll hear language of discipleship and growth and the gospel as we are going through our, our service today. And I pray that's edifying for you as we grow together. Uh, let's go ahead and rise as we sing our opening song, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me.
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. As disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to grow deep roots and produce good fruit. As disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, our growth is anchored in the saving gospel of our crucified and risen Lord. As disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to remain faithful to Christ and his church our entire lives. As disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, we know that we daily sin and fall short of God's glory. But our God has promised us in our baptism that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As we draw near to God in worship, we take a moment of silence to confess our sins to him. We pray together. Father in heaven, you have called us to be disciples of Jesus Christ, but so often we have been disciples of the world. You have called us to follow Jesus as our Lord, but so often we have followed our own desires as Lord. You have called us to resist the devil and his temptations, but so often we have given in to temptation. We make no excuses for our sins. We admit that we are powerless to save ourselves. Through the suffering and death of your beloved Son, have mercy upon us, heal us, and help us to do better. Amen. To all who repent and believe the good news of the gospel, God abundantly forgives you and renews your strength to follow Jesus. As beloved disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven and you are free to follow him with joy and courage. He will never leave you nor forsake you and he will complete the good work that he began in you. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the grace of God to grow each of us into mature disciples of Jesus Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have For the grace of God to give us joy, confidence, and freedom in the gospel, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have For the grace of God to keep us firm, faithful, and established to the end, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have Encourage, strengthen, heal, and help us, gracious Lord so that we can glorify you with one unified voice. Amen.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully hear the prayers of your people and grant us your peace through all of our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we now hear the reading of God's holy word. Our Old Testament reading for today is found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading for today is found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony as about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me. 
because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may. Good morning. Good morning. Would you please pray with me as we prepare to hear God's word? Father in heaven, we uh, pray that in these moments to follow that you would open up our hearts to your word. Father, I ask you that the same Holy Spirit that was given to your church on Pentecost uh, would be given to me, uh, that I would preach by the power of your spirit, and that each of us would have ears and eyes and hearts that are opened by your spirit uh, to receive your word that it would produce good fruit in us. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are beginning the first of six sermons uh, focusing on our new mission statement, Growing Gospel-Centered Disciples of Jesus Christ for Life. And I'm hoping you've got one of these booklets. Uh, if you haven't gotten one, just go ahead and pick one up after service. Uh, we'll have staff at the ministry desk who can help you get one of these booklets. Uh, basically, we'll be reading uh, one chapter, and then after we read that chapter, we'll preach on that the next week. And so this week, you did the introduction if you were part of a Bible study or life group, and today we'll be preaching on the introduction. The text that I want to use today is from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, a, a letter we're very familiar with. We spent a good deal of 2022 in uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, and let's go ahead and read together Romans 15, verses 5 through 6. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul gets to the end of his letter to the Romans, he's really summing up what he uh, would consider to be the purpose of the congregation, that the congregation in all of its diversity would be unified around Christ, that the, 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 the congregation being from people from different languages even, or in different nations, different experiences, different ethnicities would come together and they would with one voice together 
glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so as Paul ends Romans, he's really kind of holding out what his hope and his prayer is for the church, that they would be a unified church, a church that is very much on the same page, singing to the same tune, all in key with one another. And as I think about this text, which will be a very central text in this series, uh, I think about the doxology. Uh, you can't be in church too long and not start to kind of pick up on this tune, right? Uh, it's one of those things where if I just started singing it, a lot of you would just join in with me, and we would, with one voice together, glorify God together. Uh, it is, uh, you know, sometimes if you get around uh, people who've sung the doxology quite a bit, maybe their whole life, uh, you're going to hear different uh, octaves, and you're going to hear even, you know, some harmony going on as people draw their voices together and sing uh, these wonderful words together. And so I thought that maybe it'd be a good way to start the sermon today to kind of drive this home by if we were to sing it together. And so I thought I'd just give you a first chord, right? And then we'll all sing it together, same key, unified. Sound good? All right. Here we go. We're going to have to work on this, right? Uh, we don't even know what key we're in, right? That sounds pretty awful, right? Um, you know, instruments, uh, if you leave them just by themselves for any amount of time and say the weather changes, they get out of tune. I can guarantee you that if the weather changes and my guitar is sitting in my office, I will not just go play it because I know it's going to be somewhat out of tune. It's going to be sharp or flat, whatever the weather's been doing. If you drop an instrument, I can promise you I've never dropped this new guitar that I have, uh, but other guitars I have, I've dropped. When you drop a guitar, it's going to be out of tune. It's going to get things uh, off key, right? And as we go through this service, I think uh, the, this ser uh, sermon series, I think a good way to begin is just to recognize that all congregations, over time or because of circumstances, all congregations get out of tune, right? Uh, sometimes it's just gradual passing of time, right? that the congregation gets out of tune, the members get out of tune with one another, or maybe they get out of tune with the purpose that God has for them. Maybe they're singing out of key. Sometimes, just like if you drop a guitar, it's going to be out of tune. Sometimes a congregation will face, you know, very abrupt challenges or maybe some type of crisis, whether it be financial or a, a crisis uh, within, like, um, I'm thinking of when Holy Cross, when the um, looking right back at the back of the church, the, all that collapsed um, back in, what, 2014? And that was a, that, I think that's an out-of-tune moment, right, where, where, like, we experience something traumatic and it gets us out of tune. Um, I think that having a long-standing associate pastor vacancy, right, when after Pastor Lappy took a call to Messiah, that would have been an out-of-tune kind of thing, uh, right? And so, uh, the goal today is to talk about what it means to be out of tune, but also what it means to be in tune as a congregation, because this is the purpose of this sermon series, that we would kind of listen, are we in tune or out of tune, and then ask God by his Holy Spirit to tune us as a congregation, as individual members, to the tune that he wants us to sing so that we can glorify God together with one voice. We are going to... Sometime in the 50s AD, sometime before Paul wrote Romans, the Jews were told that they could go back to Rome. We read about this in the book of Acts, chapter 18. So imagine that you are a Jewish Christian, you had to leave Rome, and now you go back home to Rome, and you're going to go to church. But now, all of a sudden, the church is not at the synagogue. The church is meeting in houses. So imagine, like, if you moved away from Holy Cross and you came back and it's like a different building. And then imagine that all the people are different. You don't know anybody. And not only do you not know anybody, they're all Gentiles, meaning they're non-Jewish. And so when they get together for church in their homes, they're going to have some food that makes you really uncomfortable as a Jewish person. Can you see how maybe there's going to be some divisions and some disunity and some discord? 
And so I believe Paul wrote Romans to this church made up of Jews and Gentiles to help them to learn how to be unified around the gospel. And that's why Paul spends like eight chapters, eight, nine, ten, eleven chapters talking about the gospel, talking about the saving work of Jesus Christ so that these Jews and Gentiles could be unified around the gospel. Because the gospel means there's no boasting, right? You can't boast that I'm a part of the family because of my ethnicity. I'm a part of the family because I kept the law of Moses. No, there's no boasting before the cross. And so it's that message of the gospel that actually unifies people who had no real earthly reason to be unified. And that, that gospel tunes the Roman congregation back to unity. And being in tune, they are then able to join Paul. This is the other reason that Paul wrote Romans. They're being invited into partnering with Paul in spreading the gospel westward to all nations. Paul had plans to go to Spain, and he wanted the Romans to help him. So what about us as a congregation? Are we at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in tune or out of tune? You know, honestly, it kind of depends on who you talk to, right? Somebody might say, oh, yeah, we're in tune. Things are going good. Other people say, I don't know about that, right? Kind of depends on who you talk to. From my perspective, I feel like there's a lot of things that are in tune. I can tell you that I'm excited to come to work every day because of the people I work with. Uh, The staff that we have at Holy Cross, they are some of the best ministry professionals in the world, I think. I mean, they're just phenomenal people, and they are salt of the earth, light of the world people, and they really encourage me because they are gifted in ways I'm not gifted, which makes ministry a a joy for me. And so I can tell you that uh, for me, it feels like our staff is really in tune. We're excited to lean forward and do the work that God has called us to do. Uh, We have an amazing board of directors, and we're a unified board of directors, and we are looking forward to the future, asking What are the goals that we have as a congregation in the next year and the years ahead? Um, Did you know that in 2022, we had over 90 people join Holy Cross? And that's a joy, right? There's, there's, There's things that are in tune. But after 2020, I'm guessing there's a lot of things not in tune. I don't think that any church made it past 2020 in tune. That was like, we we all got dropped, right? And we're out of tune. And I think that we're still out of tune in many ways, but also I think there's some unique things in our life together at Holy Cross that could actually still make us a little bit out of tune. And I think it's good to process that out loud, our shared history that we've had here in the last three or four years. One of the things I learned uh, couple years ago, I took a a foster care class with my wife uh, back in 2020, and uh, one of the the concepts that they were teaching us is the difference between maturational loss and situational loss. This is kind of a concept they were teaching us to be aware of as you're caring for kids who've been through some trauma. Uh, So maturational loss means a loss you experience that is normal as you go through the stages of life. So for example, potty training is a maturational loss because you can't wear diapers anymore. Your parents are saying, come on, get on the toilet, right? There's a little bit of a loss there in the little world of a two or three year old, right? Uh, If you graduate high school, that's a maturational loss. You're excited to graduate, but I have to go into the world now. When, you're, when you leave for college and your parents are empty nesters, that's a maturational loss. Or when you retire, that's a maturational loss. You knew that you were eventually going to retire, but now that you're retired, there's excitement and joy. There's maybe some more hours in the day, but there's also grief and loss. Now, our congregation went through a maturational loss when your senior pastor of 10 years, Pastor Dooley, retired in 2019. That was something we knew was going to happen because every pastor will eventually retire or take another call. But it's hard. It's hard in ways that we're not even aware of when you've gotten used to the voice of a preacher and the pastoral care of a pastor. 
And then all of a sudden, it transitions. And that causes anxiety in us in ways we're not even aware of. And in fact, anytime there's a change, a change in pastors, a change in staff, there's always anxiety. Even for the people that are excited that, hey, yes, we're grieving, but we're also excited because we have uh, a new senior pastor and we have a, an associate pastor who took a call after that long vacancy. There's also anxiety. Maybe there's anxiety because you're like, I think this pastor might do what I want him to do in the church and make the church the way I want it to be, right? And then when it doesn't happen, we're disappointed and more anxious, right? Um, there's anxiety and there's grief both ways. So having a, a long-time pastor retire, uh, that is a maturational loss. Having a senior pastor uh, replace uh, a former senior pastor, that is a loss that we experience, right? It's something that causes anxiety and grief in us, even though it's natural. It takes time for trust to build, right? Now, that's a maturational loss. A situational loss is when you experience a very sudden, abrupt loss that you didn't plan on. It would be like if you got into a car accident and totaled your car, or it'd be like if you uh, were diagnosed with cancer, or if, if you had a sudden death in the family. This would be a situational loss, something you didn't count on that causes also anxiety and grief. Now, wouldn't you all agree that 2020, everything about 2020, it's, it's so interesting how we can just say 2020 and we have all these thoughts and feelings. 2020 was a situational loss for us as a society, for us as a world, and for us as a congregation. It caused all kinds of anxiety and grief in us, and still does. So I would say that the... Um, Let's process this a little bit more, the 2020. I mean, my goodness, what a year. We're glad that one's done. I know we're kind of tired of talking about it, right? We're just like, we're over it, but I think it's good to process this a little bit. You know, not only were we not able to be with one another for a season, but also people who were together grew farther apart. Relationships that were once close or broken, and family members that once talk to each other at holidays no longer do or there's distance because all this anxiety in our society really caused us to kind of put the worst construction on each other, right? So I'll give you an example. In, in, in staff here, we were trying to figure out the whole mask thing. It wasn't that fun, right? So it's like on the one hand, if we go the mask route, there's going to be some people really upset. And then on the other hand, if we don't, there's going to be people who are really upset. You really couldn't win either way. And it was tricky because we're all new as staff members. And so that trust hadn't developed. And so it was just hard. It was really hard. And, and it was just such a weird time that, that, by, that by wearing a mask, somebody would think, I bet you voted for Biden. And all these things that come with that, right? These unfair kind of slippery slope, jump to conclusion things. Or if you, if you didn't wear a mask, somebody would maybe think, I bet he voted for Trump. And all the unfair conclusions that come with that. I mean, what a messy time. It just really caused us to, to, to cancel each other, to ghost each other, to move away from each other, to not have patient conversations where we say to people, tell me more about that, I'm listening. It was a hard time. Now, I would say what's unique about Holy Cross that has maybe caused us to be a little bit out of tune is, is the fact that we experienced a major maturational loss right in the middle of a major situational loss. Like, the transition between uh, senior pastor to senior pastor and then many new staff members, a new associate pastor, all of those things happened... Those maturational loss things happen alongside this huge situational loss called COVID. Not a great environment for trust to develop, right? I, I read an article recently that was talking about a study about the effect that lack of proximity, distance, has 
on working relationships. So people who used to gather in an office around coffee or a water cooler and talk about what they did on the weekend and maybe, you know, share ideas and, you know, maybe apologize, I'm sorry, I haven't looked at your email yet, but I'll get to it. You know, that kind of cohesiveness that people often experience in an office was all of a sudden taken away. And, and many people were even working remotely for a year or two on Zoom or through email. And the, the, the finding of the study was that there's, a, 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 there's a, a correlation between lack of proximity, between distance, and lack of trust. So the more distance you have for people for a longer time, the less you're going to trust them, the more you're going to be suspicious, and the more you're going to put the worst construction, like, I bet they didn't respond to my email because they don't like me, right? Stuff like that, right? We as human beings do that. And so can you see how in a congregation where you have trust that needs to be developed with new leadership, all of a sudden you have lack of proximity for three, four months, a year, longer, you can see that maybe we as a congregation might be a little out of tune with one another. We may have come back to Holy Cross after the pandemic and we may have said, something feels off. I don't know these people, right? I think we've all responded to this grief, this loss, this change differently. Some of us have been excited. We've embraced change. We've said, hey, this is great. Um, some of us have built that trust. We have a strong relationship with our church and with one another. Maybe those of you who are new members are like, uh, I've just been here for a year, so I haven't experienced any of this. Um, some of us may have built trust, but it took time. It took face-to-face -face conversations. Some of us may be not so sure yet. Uh, some of us uh, are maybe still watching online or we're watching on, on television. And, and maybe we, we've, we've tried to cross that barrier to come back to, to worship. But every time we get up Sunday morning, there's just something that you just say, I, I can't do it. Right. Um, some of our members have gone to other churches. I'm thankful that they're part of a church. They've let us know so that we know they're in pastoral care of a congregation. Um, some of us may have no church. Um, but um, the point is that I think that there is potential for us to be out of tune as a congregation. And the purpose of this series is that we would, sermon by sermon, uh, see what it means to be in tune, what it means to walk according to God's purposes, to sing the tune that he's given us to, to sing as a congregation because God has good work for this congregation to do. Um, but we need to be unified as we do it. Now, the good news is this, is, um, you know, God, no matter how in tune or out of tune we are, God doesn't love you because you're in tune. God doesn't love you more because you're closer to being in tune and love you less because you're more out of tune. No, it's the love of God in Jesus Christ that actually tunes us. See, God finds us and loves us when we're out of tune, and it is his love and his grace alone that tunes us to where we need to be. God doesn't love Holy Cross Lutheran Church and have good purposes for it because we're in tune. If that were the case... We wouldn't make it. God loves this congregation and he has purposes for it because of Christ. Christ died for us. He laid down his life for us and was raised from the dead. And we were baptized into him before we could even be in tune. It's his love and it's his love alone that gently, patiently tunes us back to where we need to be as a congregation. One of my favorite, most treasured, beloved possessions that I have is a bass guitar that somebody threw in a dumpster once. Uh, there's a story behind this. We used to do a white elephant gift exchange every Christmas at my former church in Connecticut. Uh, the worship team would host this. We'd all get together and have a lot of fun exchanging white elephant gifts. That There was quite a history with that tradition, uh, so much so that there was a rule you couldn't bring anything living. Um, 
There was a hamster that got um, exchanged uh, back and forth. It, I think it was okay. It had found a good home. Um, but so you had, had to bring something non-living, and it had to be from your house. It had to be something that you took from your garage or your junk drawer or something like that. And so um, the item that I, uh, I think I stole from somebody, because you can do that in White Elephant, is a bass guitar that somebody had dropped into the dumpster and just left for for the dump. A friend of ours who was a bass guitar found a uh, bass guitar player found it and brought it as kind of a joke. Um, and so I took that thing home and for a while I didn't really know what to do with it until here at Holy Cross I had a friend of mine uh, on the worship team here who put new strings on it and rewired it and now it's like one of my favorite possessions. I play it all the time like when I get home from work play the bass guitar. Um, and, and I share that with you so that you know this, is that before we were in Christ, we were headed to the dump, right? Because what does it say in Ephesians chapter 2 that, that we were dead in our sins and trespasses, sinned and fallen short of God's glory, and we were not headed for good things, and yet God in his love found us not when we were beautiful or were able to even play a single note. God found us and in Christ saved us, not because of the beautiful noises we could make, but simply because he loves us. And having found us, he's made us his own treasured possessions. We are adopted by grace into his family. We are justified by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are his. God owns us, untuned and all. And yet God is, is very very uh, focused, it's his will that he would be glorified through us, right, as the church. It's his will that we would be tuned and conformed to our Lord Jesus Christ. It's his will that we would, with one voice, together glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's his will that we, as his instrument, would be used, tuned and used to his purposes. But it's because we belong to him that we're tuned to be in tune, right? And so we need to keep that in mind because some of the things we're going to talk about in our, our sermon series might be a little uncomfortable, you know, embracing a growth mindset rather than a status quo mindset, maybe talking about the language of discipleship rather than just I'm a member and I show up, right? The language, you know, of, of remaining in Christ for life, those things can stretch us but we, re we need to remember that it is the love of God that does this for us and not our own efforts, uh, not our own strength. And so as God's treasured possessions, as his beloved instruments, uh, we come to him and ask him to tune us during this sermon series so that we can, together with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And to him be the glory. Amen. We'll continue now with our offering, and uh, during our offering, there's a little black book in each of the pews. If you could just grab this and uh, register your attendance on one of the uh, connection cards and pass that down, uh, we'd appreciate that. That helps us know of your presence with us here in worship. A word about the Lord's Supper as we are going to celebrate the sacrament of the altar here in just a few moments. We encourage uh, guests in particular to take a look at our white laminated communion card in the pews. This gives us some instructions about Holy Communion. Uh, we believe that in a real and yet mysterious way uh, the risen Christ is with us in this meal. Uh, we also believe that this meal is a sign of our unity and our togetherness in the faith. Uh, and so if you haven't been instructed yet in the Christian faith in the small catechism, uh, we'd encourage you to speak with the pastor before receiving communion. Uh, if you'd like to come to the front, if you're not communing, you can cross your arms and the pastor or elder will give you uh, a blessing instead. We continue with our offering.
Let's rise together as we confess our faith. As disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess together the reality of the Holy Spirit's work among us. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Together with one voice, we give our thanks and our praise to God. up our prayers before the Lord together as his church. Father in heaven, thank you that we are your beloved treasured people. We thank you that from every nation, every tribe, every language, you have gathered a people for yourself unified around Jesus. We pray that we as a congregation in this place and in this time would be filled with your Holy Spirit so that we can together with one voice glorify you our God and our Father, Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Father in heaven, we pray that you would give us strength and encouragement to live as disciples of Jesus every day. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see those areas where you have called us each individually to grow. Be with us, Lord, when growth is difficult or when it's hard or when it comes slow. We pray, Lord, that you give patience uh, to us, both with ourselves and with one another. And we pray that your good purposes would be worked in us during this sermon series. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for your Christian church wherever it gathers in worship today, that the body of Christ in all places would be edified, strengthened, and built up. Be with those Christians who are persecuted or imprisoned for their faith. And we pray that you would give them endurance and courage. We pray that you would especially be with those congregations who have members or pastors who are imprisoned. And we pray, Lord, that you would encourage them to be with their families. And may their witness be a, a bold witness to those who have imprisoned them. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we ask you that you would be with us in all of our vocations, that you would help us in our callings, in society, in home, and in church to glorify you and honor you. Give us direction when our, our callings are difficult, and we pray, Lord, that you would help us to, to find joy in the work you've given us to do. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, we pray that you would be with those who rule over us in government. We pray that those who've been entrusted with the authority of government would use that authority well for the good of those under their care. We pray that you would give our elected leaders the ability to work with one another and strive together for the good of this nation and its people. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, Father in heaven, we pray for those who are hospitalized, those who are in nursing homes or care centers. We pray for those, Lord, who are uh, going through a rehab of any kind, we ask you, Lord, that you be with those who are struggling with depression, anxiety, or mental illness. 
We pray, Lord, that you would be with those in our congregation who have called out for us for healing. Especially we pray for Sandy Solomon, Charlie Kreitzer, Izzy Warrington, Verlene Kuhlman, and Ani Trompi. Grant to them your healing and your courage and your strength. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, be with those who grieve and mourn the reality of death. And we pray that you would comfort them with the even greater reality of Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. Draw near to the family of Colton Hill and all those who mourn his passing. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, Father, we pray that as we receive this sacrament of our Lord's body and blood, help us to treasure this sacrament above all other earthly things. And we pray that as we receive this gift, that you would grant to us what it promises, life and forgiveness and salvation and strength for our journey. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, King of creation, your whole church throughout the world from every nation, tribe, and language gives you glory, praise, and thanks for the great mercy you have shown us in Jesus Christ. From all nations you have gathered for yourself a people for your own possession a people baptized, taught, and trusting the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive our thanks for his great love shown to us in his cross and for the unshakable hope given to us in his resurrection as we share together in the gift of his body and blood in this sacrament. Give us your Holy Spirit anew and afresh that we might receive the forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood and bind us together into fellowship with one another, for as members of his body, we are all one bread. As his beloved disciples hear us as we pray in his name, and as he has taught us, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It says in Holy Scripture that our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. You may be seated as we sing.
Let's rise together and receive the communion blessing. May this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, keep you strong and steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace and serve him with joy. The Lord is with you. Amen. Let's join together in this post-communion prayer. Blessed Savior Jesus Christ, you have given yourself to us in this holy sacrament. Keep us in your faith that we may live in you even as you live in us. May your body and blood preserve us in the true faith to life everlasting. Hear us for the sake of your name. Amen. And receive this benediction from Romans chapter 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.